Welcome back, I'm Chris Moore with HVAC Pro Blog, and this week I'm excited to present part two of the series on psychrometrics and effects on airflow. This week, we're gonna wrap up a training from one year ago for my Patreon members by covering room sensible heat ratio and of course volume of air or CFM. Without further ado, here's the training. So let's talk about the room sensible heat ratio. All right, so we're gonna take our design temperature that I've been working with, 75 degrees and 50% relative humidity. And if I was to print off a manual J load calculation that's room by room or zone by zone, let's say. In this first example, room number one, we had 8,000 BTUs per hour sensible gains, 1,000 BTUs per hour latent gains. And when you add those two up, it's 9,000 BTUs total, right, for room number one. Now, in order to get the sensible heat ratio, the ratio of how much sensible versus the total, you just divide the two. So you take 8,000 BTUs in this example and divide it by the total of 9,000 BTUs for that room, and we end up with 0.89. That's the sensible heat ratio for the space, all right? So every room, though, when you do this is going to be different because you're going to have different loads in each space, different outdoor walls, windows, insulation values how leaky the rooms are. I mean, there's a whole long list of why the sensible heat ratio and the loads are different for each room. That's why the duct size is different for each room, right? Or if you're gonna zone out with ductless, why each ductless is gonna be different. It doesn't depend on solely on the, the square footage of the space, right? Depends on all the other factors that go into your load calculation. So room number one in this example was 0.89. I'm actually gonna use room number two because it's a larger space and you most likely could apply this to like a ductless unit or um, zoning out one area for that space, all right? So room number two, 10,500 sensible. Layton was 2,000 BTUs. Total gains for room number two or space number two was 12,500. Pretty close to a one ton system, right? That's what you would assume. So when you do this math, 10,500, divided by the total of 12,500, you end up with a sensible heat ratio of 0.84, okay? So 0.84 is what we're gonna use, and I'm gonna then move on to the next screen, which is gonna have a few lines. I'm gonna tell you how to draw these lines on your psychrometric chart, all right? So the first line we're gonna draw is using, that's that black line, it's gonna be our reference sensible heat ratio line. So on the right hand side, you can see the sensible heat ratio bar. And we're gonna go all the way down to 0.84 because that's the line, that's the sensible heat ratio we need for our room. And we're gonna draw a line through our standard air mark at 80 degrees and 50% relative humidity. That's our reference line, all right? Then we're gonna plot our design temperatures. In this example, our design temperature is gonna be 75 degrees and 50% relative humidity, right? The one I've been using all along here, and that's what's in uh, ACA Manual J, Table 1A if you're in most of the United States, all right? So 75 degrees, 50% relative humidity, and then we draw a line that's parallel to our sensible heat ratio line, all right? So that right there, that yellow line is gonna be our room sensible heat ratio line and you're going to want to make sure it's parallel so you start way off to the right here and you're going to draw that all the way through until it intersects where our dew point is right so in this example right around 50 degrees now um, we know our apparatus dew point but we can then pick any temperature <laughs> believe it or not any temperature on this line will cool the room but is it going to cool the room with the amount of volume of air that you have available Okay, so I just picked two temperatures here just to show you the difference. So I picked a supply temperature of 55 degrees, right? When I come down to the dry bulb, or I picked a supply temperature of 65 degrees. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist here to know 55 degree air is gonna cool the room a lot easier than 65 degree air, all right? It might take forever or it may never cool the room depending on what the load is in the room, right? but I'm gonna show you the math and what you would need to do if your supply temperature was 65 degrees, all right? Um, so, design temperature is up top, right? Sensible load for the space is what we're gonna to need to know. So we pulled that from our load calculation of 10,500 BTUs per hour. And then we're gonna use this standard uh, equation. It's CFM equals your room sensible load divided by, of course, on the bottom side, you're gonna do this part of the equation first. Um, a constant of 1.1 1 
times your room dry bulb minus your supply dry bulb. So you, since this is in parentheses, you're gonna do this first. Remember your room dry bulb is your design temperature, 75 degrees in this example. And you're gonna minus your supply dry bulb, which was coming off of the line, the sensible heat ratio line that I showed you that was in yellow on the previous slide. All right, so we plug these numbers in. I have 10,500 BTUs per hour divided by 1.1 times 75 degrees minus 55 degrees. So we div we minus these out first, that's 20 degrees times 1.1, and we divide 10,500 divided by that result, and we end up with 477 CFM. Holy moly, that lines up to just over one ton of air, right? So for the majority of the United States, we typically run 350 to 450 CFM per ton. Now, if I had a really low sensible heat ratio, I might have less airflow here. If I have a really high sensible heat ratio, I might have more airflow here, right? So 0.84 is actually pretty high, okay? So in this example here, if I have 55 degree air, I can cool this space with 477 CFM. This is not manual D. We're not sizing duct work and things like that here. This is gonna give you a target and I wanna show you what it means if you don't have the right supply temperature, okay? So temperature number two is another option off of that same reference line in order to cool the same space, the same 10,500 BTUs, but now we only have a 10 degree delta, 75 minus 65, right? So 65 degrees was another option on that line. We do the math and we need, ooh, looks like more than, oh, it's about twice the amount of air, okay? 954 CFM. That is screaming in order to cool this room. You have to have the changeover of the air in the space more often, faster, in order to cool a space with 65 degree air instead of 55 degree air. So think about this. How could we have warmer air? Maybe the duct works in an attic and it's not well vent ventilated, all right? And it's really, really hot up there and you didn't insulate the ductwork, and you thought you were designing around 55 degree air, but by the time it makes it down the end, it's 65 degrees, okay? I've seen that a few times. I've also seen it where you put in a really, really high efficient variable speed heat pump or air conditioner, and the air slows way down as you get closer and closer to the design temp, except the thermostat's in the room that's down the other end of the hall, all right? So it ramps up to try to, to deliver the air that it needs, or it slows down as it's getting closer, and when it slows down, the temperature of the air rises. And that's why those rooms that are not controlled have a different sensible heat ratio versus the critical space in the, in the house where the thermostat is. And because of that, you're not moving enough air down the end because the ductwork may have been designed for, let's say, a single stage air conditioner 20 years ago, and you just did a one-for-one -one replacement. So you gotta do not just room-by-room -room load calculations, but you actually have to make sure the new ductwork is going to work. I'm sorry, the old ductwork is going to work with a new uh, ducted system, right? So really, really important there. All right, so let's move on. I, I didn't kill you too much here with uh, math, but I just want to show you what happens, right? So think about this though. In order to cool a space with a, a standard air conditioner, a package DX system or coil, right? Typically those come 15 to 20 degree delta T. Anything more than that, you'd have to really slow the air down. So if you need a delta more than 20 degrees, you're gonna wanna probably design using chilled water. That's the only thing that's gonna get you more than 20 degree delta T uh, the majority of the time, all right? So 15 to 20 degrees for a normal air conditioner. If you want more than that, 15 to 25 degrees, let's say for chilled water. The greater the temperature difference that you have, the lower the volume of air that you need, right? That's what I just showed you on that previous slide. So if you have more than let's say 400, especially in the Northeast, 400 CFM per ton, you're probably gonna be moving the air too fast and you probably need a bigger air conditioner with less volume of air, okay? To slow it down to remove that moisture. Lower coil temperatures, so you would assume, geez, I want the coldest temperature I can possibly get, but that actually impacts the COP of the compressor, okay? So the lower the coil temperature, the harder it is for that compressor to compress refrigerant and, and make sure you have enough superheat. So, you know, low, lower coil temps work great if you're able to, let's say, have an electronic expansion valve to make sure that you don't kill compressors, but the lower that temperature, typically the more energy you're using in order to get that coil temperature that low. So uh, that typically equates to lower efficiency. Um, so usually when you're going back, if you go back to that uh, sensible heat ratio line that I drew, 
When you're picking supply target temperatures, you wanna stick right around the 85 to 95% relative humidity lines that are coming up from the bottom left to the top right, right? Remember those pink lines that I was talking about 50% relative humidity was designed? You wanna, on that sensible heat ratio, that yellow line that we drew, or orange line that we drew, you wanna stick around 85 to 95% relative humidity lines um, and you'll see 50 to 55 degrees in that example. That's what's normal in order to cool that space. Otherwise, you're gonna have really drastically high volume of air if you pick a lower relative humidity. Of course, um, if your supply air is below that line, right? So if your supply air is below that, you're gonna end up with low relative humidity, which actually isn't so bad if you're talking about cooling a space. It might feel more comfortable on an undersized system or a warmer supply temperature, right? But if your supply temperature is above that, you're gonna end up with high relative humidity if you're trying to cool that space and you're not gonna feel comfortable and you're gonna keep turning the temperature down. So really, really important for efficiency. Uh, make sure you have not only the properly sized system, but it's commissioned correctly. You have the refrigerant charge right after you set the airflow that's needed for design for the space, not 350 or 400 CFM per ton, all right? That's a great generic value, but if that wasn't what was used in the design of the ductwork and the needs of the space, you're not gonna set it up correctly and they're not gonna feel comfortable. And I just showed you why, right? It has to be on that line. Now, um, unfortunately, I just basically explained that you can't satisfy every room if you have a single zone system or even a ducted zone system with one piece of equipment, right? Think about it, your choices are putting the thermostat in the most critical zone or the center of the house. That's what they used to do, like my old 1880 Victorian here. I have a thermostat on the first floor in the middle of the house. That's where, that's where it's always gonna be 68, 70 or whatever temperature I set it for in heating, right? Not the rest of the home. The rest of the home's either much warmer or much colder, okay? Um, or your other option is maybe to average out all of the sensible heat ratios for all of those rooms and then use the average. But in that example, you're probably never going to have uh, the right one. It, it might cover one or two of those rooms, um, but at least it's close. Okay. Um, so you really don't have too much choices. The, the other choice I would say is to zone out every room that's not the right sensible heat ratio that doesn't that's not compatible right so if you have a bunch of sensible heat ratios that are really high and a bunch of sensible sensible heat ratios that are really low you group those together and that's one piece of equipment and this is the other piece of equipment that's going to be much more comfortable in the space all right um, or you do room by room zoning with a system like a multi uh, head ductless that might give you the opportunity to get really close uh, to the sensible heat ratio needed for every space okay um, one last note here, this is if you don't take any outside air. If you are taking outside air, this process does not apply and you have to completely redo the beginning piece in order to find out what your mixed air temperature and relative humidity is gonna be, okay? All right, what did you think about the training from one year ago on psychrometrics and effects on airflow? If you like this training, and you wanna get it one year in advance, head over to my Patreon page where you can actually subscribe and get everything over the last two years and all of the trainings moving forward including written blogs for as little as eight dollars a month i want to thank everybody for joining me this week at hvac pro blog where we provide advice for residential system design quality installation and system diagnosis i'll see you soon